All right, here we go. So I guess you put in 10 rubles here and you get it back when you put the cart back. So it's free, but there's an incentive to return it and not just bring it to your homeless encampment. Okay. Yeah, great American Tucker Carlson shopping in Moscow with a, one of the series of like tourist videos he did touting how wonderful Moscow is. He's using a device to get a shopping cart out in, in a French-owned grocery store in Moscow. By the way, anybody who shopped at Aldi or Lidl in America has used these devices for years, but it's quite shocking and amazing technology that's obviously Russian to great America Tucker Carlson. So this is after he had an incredibly softball interview with Vladimir Putin. And you, in light of recent events, it gets more ridiculous. But here's another video he posted from Moscow. Well, you know, you have to watch it to see what he's saying about the West. Uh, corruption. If you take people's standard of living and you tank it through filth and crime and inflation, and they literally can't buy the groceries they want, at that point, maybe it matters less what you say or whether you're a good person or a bad person. You're wrecking people's lives in their country. And that's what our leaders have done to us and coming to a Russian grocery store, the heart of evil, and seeing what things cost and how people live, it will radicalize you against our leaders. That's how I feel anyway, radicalized. We're not making any of this up, by the way, at all. Yeah, you see the little sarcastic, the heart of evil? He's radicalized against our evils who have made life hard. I mean, prices are cheaper there. That's what he's saying. It gets more bizarre. After he left Moscow, after he left Moscow, he headed over to uh, a, the World Government Summit. He was interviewed and asked very directly by the interviewer, as much as you can, why he was so soft on Putin. And this was his answer. You, you should challenge in, in, in the rules of an interview, and you're a master in, in, your, in your business. Uh, it's not for me to give you a lecture about that, but you should challenge some ideas. For instance, uh, you, you, you didn't talk about freedom of speech in, in Russia. You did not talk <laughs> about Navalny, about assassinations, about, about the restrictions on uh, opposition in the coming uh, elections. I didn't talk about the things that every other American media outlet talks about Why? exclusively. Yes, this because is my those question. are covered, and because I have spent my life talking to people who run countries in various countries and have mm. concluded the following that every leader kills people, including my leader. Every leader kills people. Some kill more than others. Leadership requires killing people, sorry. That's why I wouldn't want to be a leader. Um, that press restriction is universal in the United States. I know because I've lived it. I you know, asked my former, you know, I, I've had a lot of jobs. Um, and I've done this for 34 years and I know how it works. And um, there's more censorship in Russia than there is in the United States, but there's a great deal in the United States. And so, I, you know, at a certain point, it's like people can decide whether they think you know, what, what countries they think are better, what systems they think Sir, are better. I, 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 I just want to know what he thinks. That was yes. the whole point. Ah, uh, yes. You know, he got laid off from a private company. It's the same as being thrown out of a window from the fourth floor. But listen to what he said. Did you hear the little giggle when Navalny was mentioned? Did you hear that little giggle? Yeah, you know, because leaders kill people. I mean, this is a man who lives and dies because of the American system, capitalism. He's rich beyond measure from one, inheriting a silver spoon, two, just breaking, reaping up millions of dollars from his little his little grift that he got with Fox News and now with Twitter. And this is what we got to show. And then all of that, all of that came right before this news this morning. We're getting reports that jailed opposition uh, leader, Russian uh, opposition leader, Alexei Navalny is now dead. That is according to a, uh, the Russian prison service. He was 47 years old. He spent his final months behind bars as the Russian leader reshaped the country to rally behind his war in Ukraine. Uh, we have a lot more to talk about in terms of his life. This is a man who really dedicated his life to opposing uh, Putin's reign. He rose to prominence uh, as Russia's most outspoken Kremlin critic. Uh, he was poisoned at one point. He'd been imprisoned many times. He even tried to run against Vladimir Putin uh, in 2018 in the presidential election, but was barred from entering the race. And they kept finding reasons to throw him in jail. 
Uh, again, Alexei Navalny is dead. Alex Navalny's dead, or Alexei Navalny. Alexei Navalny's dead. Yeah. While Tucker Carlson was giving a softball interview to Putin, putting it out, being mocked by Putin, by the way, Alexei Navalny was murdered in prison. Yeah, that's the country that Tucker Carlson's been talking about. We'll have a lot more to talk about that. It's a solo show this week. As you can see, I'm in my home studio for a host of reasons. One, our wonderful guest got sick. Two, there's a snowstorm in St. Louis of all places. <laughs> so we're coming to you from home today, right on Friday afternoon. Let's get on with the show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I can't drum, no desk. <laughs> but welcome to On to Mox, F.P. Wellman. Oh, I am your host, F.P. Wellman, coming to you live from the beautiful suburbs of St. Louis, Missouri, where I live. We've got a lot to talk about. I'm going to try to focus on two, because I'm, well, focus on two issues today. Look, uh, obviously, a lot of news this week, a lot of news today, a lot of legal news between the Fonnie Walls testimony, Will's testimony, and of course, today's huge announcement in New York, where Trump and his sons have been hit very hard for hundreds of millions of dollars. Look, I don't know if you guys know a lot about the Myers Touch Network, but most of us are lawyers, except this guy. I am not a lawyer, so I know they're going to talk about those issues. I want to talk about things that come close to my home. And those two today are international, the Navalny situation, the Russia situation, Ukraine, and two, the Kansas City shooting after the Super Bowl parade. Um, I live in Missouri. I, I've been very fortunate to get to know the mayor of Kansas City. And of course, my friend Jason Kander, who I joined on Majority 54 this week. You know, as Jason and I were doing a live stream of Majority 54 on Wednesday, uh, that shooting was unfolding just a few miles away from where he lives. So those two topics we're going to talk about today and uh, we'll have a good time. We'll, well, it's going to be tough topics. So it's a shocking twist. Uh, we, we knew Navalny was in danger. If you know the history, Alexei Navalny has a long history of being an opponent of Putin. He's been accused of things, false crimes. His reputation has been smeared in a hundred different ways. He was poisoned. Uh, he was, in, he was uh, recovered from that, went back to Moscow when President Trump was president, thrown in jail, and eventually, of course, they killed him. The whole world is in shock, and I'm sure there'll be more coming out, uh, and this won't be the end of it. Here was uh, President Biden's response today, who did a press conference about it just a few hours ago. Here's President Biden, the death of uh, Alexei Navalny. You know, like millions of people around the world, I'm literally both not surprised and outraged by the news. Reported death of Alexei Navalny. He bravely stood up uh, to the corruption, the violence, and the, the all the all the bad things that the Putin government was doing. In response, Putin had him poisoned. He had him arrested. He had him prosecuted for fabricated crimes. He sentenced him to prison. He was held in isolation. Even all that didn't stop him from calling out Putin's lies. Even in prison, he was a powerful voice for the truth, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. And he could have lived safely in exile after the assassination attempt on him in 2020 which nearly killed him, I might add. And, but he, uh, he was traveling outside the country at the time. Instead, he returned to Russia. He returned to Russia, knowing he'd likely be imprisoned or even killed if he continued his work. But he did it anyway, because he believed so deeply in his country, in Russia. Reports of his death, if they're true, and I have no reason to believe it or not, Russian authorities are gonna tell their own story. But make no mistake, Make no mistake, Putin is responsible for Navalny's death. Putin is responsible. What has happened to Navalny is yet more proof of Putin's brutality. No one should be fooled, not in Russia, not at home, not anywhere in the world. Putin does not only target his citizens of other countries, as we've seen in what's going on in Ukraine right now. He also inflicts terrible crimes on his own people. And his pe yeah, Putin's not only attacking Ukraine and other countries, He's inflicting horrible crimes on his own people. I mean, every day we have reports of assassinations, oh, excuse me, accidents when people fall out of windows. His own opponent, uh, it, it was, was his plane was taken out by a bomb, Prigozhin. 
And now, of course, Alexei Navalny, who has was opposed Putin at every turn, even ran against him for president at one point, has led marches, was jailed unfairly on extremism charges, was shipped off to Siberia. Reports are that Navalny went for a walk today and didn't feel well and collapsed. And by the time medical personnel got there, he already passed. Kind of weird because literally just two days ago, he sent a video to his wife for Valentine's Day and just yesterday was seen just fine and healthy. It can't be a coincidence, you know, and what's the timing of it? What is the timing of it? You know, as we speak, our House GOP is, is debating not even uh, fielding a bill, not even putting a bill for vote that came a bipartisan bill for defense aid for Ukraine, Israel and aid to Gaza. They're just sitting on it while they take a two week break. You know, and, and you have to wonder, many of us were wondering right away, you know, what would be the response and the right to all of this? You know, what would they say? Well, here's a taste of exactly how you think that will go, because it's just like you think it would go. Here's Fox News in a brief clip of, well, here's their latest piece about what would have really happened. I think you could even venture to, to wonder if Alexei Navalny would have been, died been treated how he was if there was a different president in office today. All, all I know is can the. Yeah, right. It maybe wouldn't have died if it had been a different president. You know what's ridiculous about that statement? Navalny was poisoned in Germany by Putin under Trump. He almost died. He bravely went back to Russia and was arrested immediately under Trump. You know how many things Trump said about it? Nothing. Nothing. We all talked about it at the time that, that Trump would never say anything negative about Putin. And he didn't. So the idea that somehow Trump having been president would have saved it or not stopped this. I'm so sick of this thing. I know you're sick of it. It's so ridiculous. This is a guy who loves Putin, talks about Putin all the time. And what is the timing of this, of this murder finally? Why did Putin finally let him die? Why? Well, the timing is interesting. And there is something to do with Trump. Why? We all saw him last week, right? We've been talking about it all week. This video from South Carolina, which Trump has repeated numerous times. I mean, just you have to watch it again just to believe how insane it is what Donald J. Trump is saying in this completely fabricated, completely made up story. Because you know why? It starts with Sir. It's a Sir story. Check out the st Sir story that, you know, did it have something to do with all this? Presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, Will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay, you're delinquent. He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You gotta pay. Yeah, do whatever the hell they want. And a week later, Navalny's dead. Because, you know, Trump's gonna let him do it if he gets back in. If you don't think it's gonna happen when Trump comes back in office, you're fooling yourself. And here's the thing, we don't have to wait that long. Already the House GOP is undermining us. Already the Putin apologist all week. We had Tommy Tuberville talking about how great the interview was. I mean, it's been sick to watch members of the Republican Party, a party of Reagan, the man who said Gorbachev should tear down the wall. Instead, you got Tommy Tuberville and J.D. Vance, and you got Ron Johnson saying that Putin's going to win the war in Ukraine, and we should just stop supporting Ukraine and let him win. And it just goes on. And then you go over to the House. You got Speaker Johnson sitting on the bill. You got Margie Taylor Greene and, and others saying we shouldn't fund Russia's the, uh, the defending Ukraine from Russia. And and this is this is a video that came out that I just can't believe myself. Here's Margie Taylor Greene being asked in the hallway of Congress about the aid package and how our allies are getting nervous that they are not supporting this. And UK Foreign Minister David Cameron came out and said that it's not unlike at all the idea of those who appeased Hitler. And here's what happened when Sky News asked Marjorie Taylor Greene about that. David Cameron says that you should vote through funding for Ukraine. What do you say to that? I think he tried to compare us to Hitler also. And if that's the kind of language he wants to use, I really have nothing to say to him. Well, he likened you to an appeaser to Hitler in not voting through funding for Ukraine. Are you an appeaser for Putin? I, I think that um, I really don't care what David Cameron has to say. I think that's rude name calling um, and I don't appreciate that type of language. And David Cameron needs to worry about his own country. And frankly, he can kiss my ass. But do you think Putin's the good guy in all this? Slam that door, don't you? Just slam the door right in his face.
doesn't like being called out. But that's the truth. Look, what the Republicans are doing in Congress is allowing Putin to have free reign to murder and kill. What they're allowing him to do is to continue doing things like murdering Alexei Navalny. And it's just ridiculous. And I, I don't even know who these people are. And imagine the long-term damage to America's reputation abroad. Can we be trusted anymore? Would anyone trust us that the major political party in the United States government is willing to just simply ignore atrocities and murders and invasions where the leading candidate for the Republican nomination has essentially said that if you don't pay up to NATO, you won't get defended? I mean, let's not even forget the fact. I mean, you guys know we talked about the other day. NATO isn't Mar-a-Lago. It's not a club where you pay up to be. It's not a protection rack like the mafia. No, NATO is a treaty defense. A, a mutual defense treaty where our, our partners are committed to spending 2% of their GDP on their defense. That's it. You don't pay the, we're not, they're not paying us to defend them. That's not how it works. And by the way, when we needed them, they were there. After 9-11, they invoked Article 5 and supported our efforts in Afghanistan. The International Security Assistance Force, ISAF, was a NATO organization. When we needed help, they were there for us. And nobody asked us what the price was. But Donald Trump's putting a price on it. If you don't think Vladimir Putin's not paying attention, he damn sure is. And what gives me hope and gives me pride is that Biden's had enough. He took questions from the press today. And when asked about this thing, this is what he said about their congressional Republicans dragging their feet. And I stand by with him on this one. Is there anything you can do to get ammunition to the Ukrainians without a supplemental from Congress? No, but it's about time they step up, don't you think? Instead of going on a two-week vacation. Two weeks. They're walking away. Two weeks. What are they thinking? My God. This is bizarre. And it's just reinforcing all the concern and, and, and almost, I won't say panic, but real concern about the United States being a reliable ally. This is outrageous. Real concern. Our allies have real concern. Two-week vacation. They adjourned for two weeks. Mike Johnson sent them home. They come back three days to go before the government shuts down. Three days. They're not trying to pass bills, not trying to do anything. This government is ineffectual. And I tell you what, they're paying a price for it. The one thing you saw out of New York 3, and here's, here's the thing about New York 3, folks. So if you're not familiar, New York 3 uh, was, was, the, was the race for George Santos's old seat. It happened on Tuesday in New York. It's part of Long Island and Queens. Uh, it was close. Uh, you know, the, if you look at the, the polls, polls had a one to three point margin, Democrat on top, but it was close. He ended up winning by 7.5 points. But what was interesting about that, and I talked about it with Jason Cantor the other day, is how many of the voters flat out told people, reporters and others, that they were voting for the Democrat because they were sick and tired of the Republican Congress not getting anything done, not passing bills. This is the most ineffectual Congress in American history. They've only passed 20 bills in the first year of the Congress. Nothing, nothing's getting done. And people are sick of it. They're paying attention. And I, I, I know we all worry about the hand wringing. We're not going to, you know, what's going to happen. But this do nothing, con just like 1948 for Truman, do nothing Congress. And Americans are getting sick and tired of it. We've, we, we flipped a freaking seat in a special election. And there's more coming. There's more coming. Because Americans are sick and tired of a do nothing Congress that doesn't live our values. I mean, what's conservative about the idea of a congressman being paid money to do nothing but go on Fox News, right? I mean, that's what we're paying for. I mean, if I was a conservative still, I'd be pissed. They're wasting my money, wasting our time, accomplishing nothing. In the meantime, the world really is on fire. And they all want to blame Biden. They all want to blame DOD, whomever. It's them. They are the problem. And there's real world issues and real world impact. And the world is watching us. The cowardice and the lack of spine. It's bizarre. You know, I've been watching so much video of Navalny, you know, since he died today. And what a brave guy. What a brave man. And his family's incredible. You know, he died. They announced it just as the Munich Security Conference was convening. 
just as they're all meeting to open the Munich Security Conference, great. It, this, if you're not familiar, this is where Western powers meet, discuss national security issues. Vice President Kamala Harris was opening it. They announced Navalny's death just an hour or so before the opening of the conference. Not a coincidence. And Navalny's wife got up and spoke. So as I looked at all this stuff, I watched. And I want you guys to see this. And uh, for those who listen, it's in Russian uh, at the end. And uh, I'll go back and read it through for you if you like. But for those who aren't familiar, there's a wonderful uh, documentary about Navalny. I think CNN shot it. It's available now. And they asked him what his message would be if he dies. And if you're watching, you're viewing, watch his face if you can. Watch his face. The bravery of a man who knows his fate. Anyway, let's watch this clip. My message for the uh, situation when I'm killed is very simple, not give up. Do me a favor, answer this one in Russian. And here I have just an obvious thing. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. If it happened, it means that we are unbelievably strong in this moment, if they decided to kill me. Но и нужно использовать эту силу, не сдаваться. Помните о том, что мы огромная сила, которая находится под гнетом вот этих вот чуваков плохих, лишь потому что ну, мы не можем осознать, насколько действительно мы сильны. Все, что нужно для торжества зла, это бездействие добрых людей. Поэтому бездействовать не надо. I'll read it again. Listen, I got something to tell you. If they decide to kill me, you're not allowed to give up. If they decide to kill me, I mean, that's what, that's why it means that we are incredibly strong. We need to utilize this power to not give up, to remember we are a huge power that this being oppressed by these bad dudes we don't realize how strong we actually are. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. So don't be inactive. Those will be his last words. So hold your congressman. <laughs> so let's call Congress, right? Let's hold it. Let's, let's live up to that. Because I tell you what, guys, if you don't think that could happen here, don't be fooled. Steve Bannon's literally said, you know, he wants to put heads on pikes. Okay. Stephen Miller is talking about building deportation camps. Mike Flynn's been talking about these apocalyptic themes, you know, of, of a holy war in our country. Those are real things happening in this country. If Donald J. Trump takes power again, now there's hope. There is hope. I mean, he just got fined millions of dollars. I think he's almost up to half a billion dollars that he owes right now between E. Jean Carroll and New York and more to come. We also know that March 25th, he starts his trial in New York for the, the Stormy Daniels payoff, which they're calling a hush money trial. Uh, you know, but really it's an election. I mean, I think the, the uh, AG himself said it's, a, it's an election interference trial. The whole point of paying that money to Stormy Daniels was to influence the election so it wouldn't come out before he got elected. That's next month. You know, March 25th, it'll be the first time in history a United States president faced a criminal trial. And that's Donald Trump. So we can't have him take power because he loves this. I said something today, you know, I, I wonder if you guys would agree with me, but, you know, that there's been a lot of quiet. Actually, it's been pretty quiet for the Republicans. You know, J.D. Vance said, uh, oh, I, I, don't, I don't worry about foreign countries because we have enough problems here. They do not want to criticize Putin, which is terrible. And I said, you know, I said, it's not, they're not, they're not mad at Putin. They're impressed. They're impressed. And, and they're telling us, they're telling us. So it's a sad day. It's a sad day to see that Alexei Navalny has finally lost his life after persistence and hanging in there as long as he did here in 2024.
You know, someone told me there are science-backed ingredients that could help me feel 15 years younger in just a matter of months. I wouldn't have believed it. Well, then I tried Qualia Senolytics. You know, as we age, everyone accumulates senescent cells in their body. Senescent cells cause symptoms of aging, such as aches and pains, slow workout recoveries, sluggish mental and physical energy that I know so well, all associated with that middle-aged feeling. Now, also known as zombie cells, they're old and worn out and serving a no useful function for your health anymore, but they're taking up space and nutrients from our healthy cells. You know, much like pruning the yellow and dead leaves and plants in my garden, Qualia Senolytic removes those worn out senescent cells to allow for the rest of them to thrive in your body. You take it just two days a month. The formula is non-GMO, vegan, as well as gluten-free. And the ingredients are meant to complement one another, factoring in the combined effect of all the ingredients together. But best of all, on top of all that, you have a 100-day money-back guarantee. And since taking Qualia Senolytics, I have had higher energy levels, I feel 15 years younger, more productive, enthusiastic in life, not to mention, importantly for me, less aches and pains. Now, resist aging at the cellular level. Try Qualia Senolytic. Go to neurohacker.com slash Fred for up to $100 off, and then use code Fred at checkout for an additional 15% off. That's neurohacker.com slash Fred for an extra 15% off of your purchase. And man, thanks Neurohacker for sponsoring our show. Heart health and staying healthy, especially when you have family, friends, or loved ones that you want to be able to spend as much time with as possible is so important. You know, February is Heart Health Month in the United States, and more than half the population would still benefit from blood pressure support. Super Beats Heart Choose, the number one doctor, pharmacist, and cardiologists recommend a way to support healthy blood pressure, and they even promote heart-healthy energy without the stimulants. Paired with a healthy lifestyle, the antioxidants in Super Beats are clinically shown to be nearly two times more effective at promoting normal blood pressure than a healthy lifestyle alone. And with over 40,000 five-star reviews and counting, people are raving about Super Beats Heart Shoes. Super Beats Heart Shoes are absolutely delicious and are truly much better than any alternative supplements out there. I take my Super Beats Hard Shoes each morning and it's really helped me kickstart my day. And after taking my Super Beats Hard Shoes, I feel like I have more energy and I'm ready to take on the day. Super Beats Hard Shoes support healthy circulation. So you not only get blood pressure support, you also get productive, heart healthy energy without the crash. So support your heart health with Super Beats Hard Shoes. Get a free monthly supply of Super Beats Hard Shoes on all bundles and a free full-sized bag of turmeric chews valued at $25 with your order by going to our spot, democracybeats.com. Get this exclusive offer only at democracybeats.com. That's democracybeats.com. Check it out. I swear by them. But, you know, it's been a rough week, man. I mean, then you throw in the shooting in Kansas City. You know, why do I care about that? Well, I live in Missouri. Um, I'm a Chiefs fan. You know, we're thrilled to have win again, back to back. Everybody was mad at us for doing it. And the moment of celebration as the parade wrapped up on, on Wednesday outside Union Station in Kansas City, shots rang out. Shots rang out. And we don't know what happened yet, but we're pretty sure. Witnesses say they heard a disagreement in the crowd as they were heading to the parking lot. They heard a woman yell, not here, don't do this here. And then shots rang out. Two juveniles have been arrested. Actually, three juveniles were arrested. Two were released. They have been charged with fleeing police at this point. I think they're using it to hold them for now. One was tackled by um, was one was tackled by onlookers. I won't run that video. You know, getting tackled by fans um, with a giant gun falling out of his hand. Um, I I've been calling this kind of a it's kind of terrible, but <laughs> I, I call these kind of shootings uh, the fuck you, fuck you, bang bang shootings. And what that means, and when I say that, what I mean is we're so awash with guns in America. Guns are so ubiquitous now in our country that what used to be just guys bumping chest or kids getting mad at each other and throwing some punches, now it's fuck you, fuck you. Instead of being punch, punch, it's bang, bang. Because guns come out and people die. In this case, it appears that one of these young men sprayed the crowd with bullets. And now there's 22 people injured and a mother dead. A woman, a lovely human being from every measure. Jason Cantor knew her. She was a year behind him in high school. And she's dead because young men, juveniles, had guns. But here's the part that's going to really make you crazy. We live in Missouri. And you may have heard her now this week, but I want to talk about it too. 
because we have a problem with guns in Missouri. We'll start off with this clip of Mayor Quentin Lucas, who everybody calls Mayor Q, speaking at a press conference that day when he was asked about the security. And it's really key. Listen carefully. Just how many police were there. Listen, listen to Mayor Q and what he's saying. How scared. You had over 800 officers deployed to work this parade, to work outside of Union Station, and still in a matter of moments, 22 people were shot. I mean, that's, that's what happens with guns. I won't get in a big debate right now. I think we're still doing an investigation. But, I mean, what you saw happen was why people talk about guns a lot. We had over 800 officers there, staffed, situated all around Union Station today. We had security in, in any number of places, eyes on top of buildings and beyond. And there still is a risk to people. And I think that's something that all of us who are our parents, who are just regular people living each day, have to decide what we wish to do about it. Parades, rallies, schools, movies, it seems like almost nothing is safe. And we had hundreds of law enforcement there working hard today. And I, wanna, I, I do want to echo the, what the chief said, who are running towards danger, but in a matter of seconds, Someone who wants to disrupt anything, someone who wants to create any type of situation, or someone who is very simply reckless, can change not just one life or two lives, but almost two dozen. And that to me is absolutely devastating, and it makes me feel vastly more concerned as a parent just in the world today thinking about that. 800 law enforcement officers. This whole thing went down in seconds. Seconds. More police isn't the answer. Good guys with guns aren't the answer. But here's why. Here's why this is going on in Missouri. I, I actually had to write these down. It is shocking what's happening. You can draw a straight line from the pro-gun policies that this state that I live in, that you've heard so much about now, has dismantled. They have dismantled the laws and now become Per gun violence is pervasive in the state and they want to blame the cities and the criminals, but that's not the truth. The truth is they have gotten rid of the laws over the last 20 years. Here's some examples of what's happened in the last 20 years. And, and why is 20 years key? For 20 years, the Republican Party has had a majority and now a supermajority in the legislature of this state. There are no statewide Democratic offices. Well, there's one now. That's it. They control the Senate. They control the House by a supermajority. And what does supermajority mean? Supermajority means they can pass laws without a single Democratic vote. The Democrats could leave the state and they could still pass the laws. They don't need them. We're trying to break that, but this is what they've done. An example, they repealed the permit and background check requirement to purchase a handgun in 2007. They've prevented cities and counties from enacting their own gun policies. They did that in 2016. They repealed the concealed carry permit requirements. They passed one of the most extreme gun laws in the country in 2021. They, they passed a law that they're trying to defend where it's illegal for local police agencies and departments to cooperate or enforce federal gun laws. They literally took us out of like ATF gun task forces. They actually defunded much of our police who were getting federal dollars. They literally, to protect guns, imagine if you will what you're hearing. That if a police officer sees some of the gun and enforces a federal regulation, he could be charged. He could be sued. That's what they did. These are the, the pro, the pro uh, p police uh, folks. A 2020 study by Johns Hopkins University, the Center for Gun Violence Solutions, concluded that repealing the requirements for permit and background checks to own handguns in 2007 in Missouri was associated with a 47% increase in gun homicide rates and a 23% increase in gun suicide rates. Currently, we have no age restrictions on gun use and possession in Missouri. Think about that number. 47% increase in violence because they repealed a simple law. What's the big deal about having to have a permit for a deadly weapon or a background check to buy a deadly weapon? How does that make any sense? Except that a gun industry, and not, and you know, before we go any further, it's not the NRA, folks. I, I hear this all the time from, especially on the left. Oh, it's the NRA. NRA is not 
the big power anymore. There's been a shift in the last five years. For those who don't follow guns, and, and by the way, let me make something very clear. I'm a gun owner. I grew up here in St. Louis. There's a little quarry. I live not far from a quarry where my father would take us to shoot as a child. I learned, a matter of fact, one of the first times I ever fired a gun, my dad, my dad had the 357 Magnum, which if you guys know it, it's a freaking hand cannon, okay? Giant gun, okay? My dad loved his Maggie, he called it. He was a Marine. My dad was a Marine in World War II. As a child, we're talking 1972, probably, 1971. My father took me down to this quarry. Not far. I mean, really, just a few miles from where I live. That's what you could do back then. You just go to quarry and shoot. <laughs> I mean, times were different. My dad, to teach me how deadly serious guns were, put my very small body. And if you guys know me, I'm a big boy now, but I was a little whiff of a child. And he put me on this boulder and uh, gave me his, his 357 Magnum, taught me how to use it, taught me how to shoot it, showed me all the rules, put my hands out, said, all right, go ahead and shoot this thing. I took this cannon of a handgun. I took one shot and the recoil from a handgun threw me off the rock. And my father caught me. And I remember distinctly looking up at him, him saying, get it? Do you see how powerful this is? How dangerous it is? And I didn't play with guns. My dad kept them in the house. We had several handguns and long guns. Um, I had one growing up. I had a long gun growing up. I had a 22 rifle growing up. I was taught from an early age. Then I entered the army where before I could touch a weapon, I had a background check. Before I could touch a weapon, I had to be trained on it. Before I could touch a weapon, I could have to check it out of the arms room where ammunition was stored separately. I had a, a hand receipt. If I damaged that weapon or I lost that weapon or mishandled that weapon, I would be charged in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. If I, if I had an accident or I shot from that weapon, I could be charged with a crime. Those are the basic rules of being a soldier with a weapon. But let's bring it back to Missouri where I grew up. Missouri currently is the 48th. It's rated to have the 48th worst gun laws in America. We're third. Third in the United States of gun laws. Here's a sample I put out. I put this on my, my sub stack the other day, guys. Here's a sample of gun laws in Missouri. There are no background checks for private sales. There's no permit required for concealed carry. There's no permit required for open carry. No license required for any owners. There's no firearms registration whatsoever. There's no assault weapon restriction or laws in any way. There's no magazine capacity restrictions. There's no red flag laws of any kind. And there's no age restrictions on open carry, possession, or purchase. Some of that red flag law and what happened just recently. Back before Halloween, there was a, I don't know what you want to call it. There was a violent incident at a trunk or treat at a local elementary school or middle school parking lot. It was in the parking lot. Cars were lined up. It was elementary school day. So it was all elementary school kids there to go from car to car, picking up candy. And a guy came, turns out he was an off-duty police officer, got in a, some kind of, we don't know. He's, he was acting crazy. But we, this is what the incident, et cetera, got in, a, got in a fight with somebody, pulled out his weapon, started shooting in the air, threatening everybody, got tackled. Okay. No one got killed or hurt, but kids were traumatized. They had to shut it down. They had to bring in counselors to school because these kids were traumatized by somebody emptying a magazine in the air amongst trick or treaters. But here's the part that's going to bake your brain. This guy had been acting crazy for a week. Reports came out afterwards that just a few days before in Kirkwood, Missouri, which is actually where I grew up, he was driving through town erratically, chasing people, threatening people, that he ran his car and other cars. And he was following them. When a woman pulled out in traffic, he threatened her and, and, and chased her. She pulled off into a parking lot of a local church, called the police. And they said, is it a Jeep? Because they'd already had reports of this guy. Okay. They said, hey, drive to the police station. And so she drove to the police station. Before she got there, the guy peeled off and went a different direction. So I want you to think about this. They knew. So who is the guy? He was a cop. St. Louis County police officer. His father was a former prosecutor in the county. Yeah. He's the son of a former prosecutor and a cop himself. Believe it or not, they were not allowed by law. Either they had arrested him, found him, talked to him. Missouri law 
does not allow them to take away his guns. Not only that, Missouri red, has the opposite of red flag law. The police could be charged or at least sued if they took away his guns. A gun he would, on Sunday, commit a crime with. That's the insanity of the gun laws in this state. Even as we speak, as I do this video, uh, we had this podcast, this weekly show, as we speak, there's laws being submitted in the state legislature, as we speak, to not just that, they want to lower the concealed carry age down to 18. They want to bar churches and other facilities from banning guns. Believe it or not, they want to make it easy for you to bring a gun to church. Ah, because the good guy with the gun is going to save us. No good guys can to save anybody on Wednesday. Because it happened in seconds. And what happens then? Let's say a good guy with a gun pulled his gun out. So then you have a crossfire in a crowd of 100,000 people shooting at each other. By the way, when the cops show up, who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? Which one do the cops shoot? Because the good guys and bad guys are shooting it out. And I'm here to tell you, having been in a crossfire in combat, it's really hard to tell which bullets are good guy bullets and which ones are bad guy bullets. Because you know what? Bullets don't give a shit. And they don't come screaming and say, I'm a bad guy, bullet. They're just bullets. And nine kids got shot. Nine kids. It just makes you infuriate. It makes me furious. It should make you furious. And when will we be mad enough? When's enough enough? We're just going to move on. It's too soon. Thoughts and prayers. You know, the punch on this whole story is someone put out a tweet saying that they were running next to the governor of Missouri, the guy who enacted most of these laws, the guy who eagerly passed the Second Amendment, of what they call Second Amendment Preservation Law. I don't even know the name of the goddamn law. It's so stupid. Governor Parson, the farmer, running with the security detail from the massacre that his laws helped create. The free fire zone in Missouri. And the punchline of all of this is another law they're trying to do right now is the legislature wants to take over the St. Louis Police Department because of all the crime. Localities like Kansas City and St. Louis are not allowed to pass their own restrictions on guns because the state overruled them so much for local rule. That's what we face in this state. So when they tell you, oh, Republicans are the ones who want to save you. Oh, it's the liberal cities. It's bullshit. Okay. More guns are not the answer. When's enough enough? Look, nobody's trying to take your damn guns away. Like I said, I remind you, I have guns in a locker under lock and key with a fingerprint with the ammunition stored separately because I'm not an idiot. What's wrong with a background check? What's wrong with having to have a permit? What's wrong with having training? Look, I wrote in a substack yesterday. I don't understand why the gun industry doesn't support mandatory training. Think how much money gun stores would make for mandatory training you have to take you have to pay let's say you had to pay a hundred dollars to get training and it, you know the gun stores can make even more money off the guns by forcing people to have to have training feels like they're missing an opportunity but i just want no people to know how to handle a weapon just as much as the people driving these cars and you should too and then we find out these were juveniles and then what really is going to bake your brain, if those juveniles have been walking around that parade with their guns slung over their shoulders, the police couldn't stop them. That if those kids who shot those people had been walking around the guns openly, it would have been perfectly legal. And we would have been saying they were responsible gun owners right up to the point they started yelling, fuck you, fuck you to each other, and then shot a crowd. And then suddenly they weren't responsible gun owners anymore, apparently. You won't hear that. But I can't, I'm not going to say anymore. more. I'm going to say something, let somebody else say it. And I hope we don't get any trouble. But I could run, I would love to run this whole clip. But Nick Wright is a sports, uh, if you know him, he's on FS1. Uh, he's got a show there. He's, he's terrific. I don't always agree with all of his takes. Uh, but he's a Kansas City native. And he was at the parade. So I wanted to do just a short clip of what was a seven and a half minute monologue that he did, and you can find it online. But here's Nick Wright talking about the insanity of what he saw. And he started this rant off talking about how the kids, how we've broken these children. He, he, <laughs> I get upset. He talked about how when they got to the hotel safely, there was a woman, probably a grandma, uh, on the phone, and she told him, she recognized him, and she was crying 
because she told him that when all hell broke loose, her 40-year-old granddaughter took charge of the group and led them to safety because her 40-year-old granddaughter had mass shooter drill training. I want you to wrap your head around that. That when bulls started flying, a 40-year-old middle school girl had to take charge of her family because of her vast experience from shooter drills at school. That's the generation we're raising. And that's the generation we're traumatizing. My favorite one I saw when I commented about this online was somebody's like, well, we just need to enforce the laws in the books. What laws? I just told you for 10 minutes. Missouri's rolled them all back. There's virtually no gun laws in this state. And they want that everywhere. They want us flooded with guns. So the least, the least little bit confrontation ends up in murder. Lives ruined. Over what? Road rage shootings every day. At some point, we got to wake the fuck up. It pisses me off, man. I was looking forward to watching the parade afterwards. I love those guys. I want to see Travis Kelsey sing Friends in Low Places. Haven't seen any of that because the only story out of the Super Bowl parade now is slaughter. We've got to hold them accountable, folks. I know you're the Midas Mighty. I know you're fans of my show on Democracy. You're in the fight. Hold them accountable. Call your legislators. Run for office. Invest. Volunteer. I had the nicest phone call. I was on, the, I was on a veterans group the other day. Uh, every Thursday, there's a great coffee chat. DNC uh, has a veterans group. And uh, man, five of the people in the group went up to New York to canvas from Virginia and other places. That's how you do it, man. Start dialing. Volunteer the local campaign. Volunteer the campaign far away. Most of them will let you volunteer and do phone banking from far away. There's an app. Do something, man. Just do something. Because this ain't working. Let's face it. This ain't working. I know we talk a lot about the threat of Trump. We, I, I talked about the top of the show. We talked about the threat of, of MAGA conservative. But this is real stuff. Before MAGA, these laws are being rolled back. It's not just the NRA anymore. It's the gun makers themselves. We're flooded with guns. And they want to keep flooding us with guns. And at what point do our children matter more than a gun? It's a tool. Just a tool. It's like shovels. Well, that's a lot for this week for a solo show. <laughs> uh, I hope you hate, it wasn't a downer. Uh, but man, I mean, it's hard not to be passionate about this stuff, right? It's hard. So as usual, leave a comment, say hi. Um, let's have a conversation about this. I'm not, a, I'd love to have a conversation with you about this. As always, say hi in the comments. Be sure to subscribe to our Substack, fpwellman.substack.com. Uh, I'm putting some stuff out right about once or twice a week. I promise to do more. I always say that, but life is crazy. Check out your local campaigns. You can find me as always. I'm still on X slash Twitter at FP Wellman, at FP Wellman. I'm enjoying, still enjoying threads, even though they're going to talk about getting rid of political content, but FP Wellman official on Instagram and threads. Of course, our channel on Democracy Podcast on YouTube. I'm proud to still be the national chairman of Forgotten Democrats. If you haven't checked them out yet, uh, you can find a lot out. You can text FRED to 33777. That's the Forgotten Democrats that I'm proud to be a part of, which would be a part of this, right? This is about rolling back the Republican Congress, rolling back Republican power. We've got to run people everywhere. Forgotten Democrats is helping Democrats who are underfunded find the funding they need to run for office. In the meantime, fight's not over. We've had some wins, okay? Suwazi winning was fantastic. I know the margin, uh, Johnson has no margin for error now. He's got two votes. He can, only, he can only lose two Republicans to pass laws. That's really thin. And they're starting to break, I think. We'll see. But in the meantime, we have to do the work. While we are winning, the only way to truly win is to do the work and keep up the fight. So hang in there. I got a great show for you next week. I'm I already know the guest. I got Trey Crowder, the liberal redneck. <laughs> I already got him booked. Uh, he's on tour right now. He's got a book out. Can't wait for you guys to talk to him. In the meantime, stay in the fight. Keep up hope. I know a lot of today's conversation was a hopeful one like I try to be, but the hope is there. We will win. We're on the right side of history. It's up to people like you and me. We'll see you next week.